Good morning. Welcome to worship at First Presbyterian Church of hot and humid Gainesville, Florida. Uh, we are glad to have you all with us, and we are glad to be out of the sun even this early in the morning. So um, glad that we're here, and we come expectant that when we gather as a community of God, that it's just not this uh, thing that we jump through, this hoop, this uh, thing that we do, but we believe that as we come together, that God comes together with us, and God moves us and changes us and sends us away different. And so we come with that ex expectation, we come with that excitement, looking forward to participating in what God is doing in his coming kingdom. Uh, we gather in three different ways today. We have people in our sanctuary with us. We have two groups um, that are uh, accessing us remotely. We have a group on television and we have a group on the internet and we are thankful for all of you. All three of you are part of who we are and especially for those of you that are accessing remotely. We want you to know you are part of what we do here and if there are things going on in your lives we want to know about it too. Contact us, email us, call us, do stuff. You are part of this church as well, and we gather this way every Sunday. I hope you got a copy of our worship guide. For those of you that are with us in person, uh, you can get it in the back of the sanctuary if you didn't get it yet. For those of you at home or uh, accessing us somewhere else, uh, go to our webpage, to the homepage, scroll down just a little bit, and there is a copy that you can either look out or print out for uh, your convenience. And our goal in providing a worship guide is not only to help you understand what is happening, what's going on next, but it's also to be a participant in worship. God is invite, inviting you to participate in worship with him, and we want to accept that invitation. On the back of our worship guide is a list of announcements. I'm going to highlight a few, but make sure that you read them all so you know what's going on in the life of your church. We extend our sympathy and offer the prayers of our congregation to Jeannie Thomas upon the, and her family upon the passing of her sister, Polly Cornwell, who joined the church triumphant on July 6, 2022. Just a few minutes before this service started, uh, a group of parents and others gathered to send our uh, youth, our middle schoolers and our high schoolers uh, off to Fun in the Sun camp. Um, it was so hot, you can tell who we were because the people who were there that are here now, they're the ones with sweat stains on them. Um, I thought Fred was going to spontaneously combust out there. It was, it was that brutal. Um, but we made it, we got them off, and uh, please be in prayer for them, both the leaders and the students this week. We want them to meet Jesus. We want them to have a powerful experience this week. We don't want this just to be a silly go off to camp. We, want so, we hope that they'll have fun and there will be silliness and stuff like that, but we want it to be meaningful and impactful. And uh, thank you for those of you that allowed them um, to go off. Some of you provided scholarships and paid for your children or whatever. We really appreciate that. And uh, let's hope that they have a good experience this week. Um, after the service, we're going to have kind of a round table uh, off in Gordon Hall. Uh, one of the things that we're trying to do in our parking lot discussion is make that discussion more accessible. Um, so uh, one of the ways is not just to do the big upfront conversation, but also small little get-togethers. So that's our goal today. Um, Jeff Spiegel is going to lead one of those, so after this service, if you want to head over and hang out at a table and talk to Jeff about uh, the different aspects of that, it's the goal of the parking lot committee not to convince you of what you should do, but to help you understand all facets of what's before us in this decision and to be able to do it well. So uh, if you're interested in that, head over and catch up with Jeff after this service. Our uh, church is blessed to partner with several different ministries, uh, both in town, um, in our region, and all over the world. But one that we partner with in town is Gainesville Community Ministries. Uh, Michael and Lisa, who are the leaders over there, are members of our congregation. They're important 
uh, parts of what we do. And they, every year about this time, they start a backpack drive to help underprivileged people, uh, students, uh, head back to school with a backpack that has what they need in it so they can succeed. Um, thank you for every year being part of helping empower them, helping fill those backpacks. All of the explanation is in the worship guide, but if you have any questions, don't hesitate to call our office uh, and we'll explain anything to you. One of the things I noticed not long after I got here, uh, well, I guess it was a little while after I got here because I had three weeks and then we were closed for a while and then we came back uh, slowly after that. But one of the things I realized is that people uh, head out of this building generally in two ways. Through um, the, I don't know if you call this the back or the front, but the main doors right there. But then we have a lot of people that head out through the north courtyard. And we want to make sure that you have the opportunity to engage with some staff. Typically, our staff's all been out there, but we have a lot of people go out this way. So now, uh, we are going to be uh, kind of balancing that. We're going to have staff at both locations. You can interact with us um, at either of those ways out. And for some of you, the most important thing for you to know, if you're trying to avoid us, head out through the playground. That will always be the safe exit. So you know who you are. We know who you are too. So let's not kid, but that is an option. Let us continue to worship the Lord. I invite you to join me in standing for our call to worship. Although Jesus was God himself, he 
He gave away his glory, taking on the lowliest of positions. The God who demands justice from us is also the God who pours mercy out upon us. Trusting in that gracious love he gives, let us confess our sin before God and one another. I invite you to join us in our corporate prayer, followed by a time of silent personal reflection. Please join me. O oh God, we are your sons and daughters, descendants of the Most High God yet we do not behave to honor you, and our actions belittle the love you have for us. We do not imitate your example. We do not uphold the poor or the oppressed. We do not commit to efforts to rescue the weak and the needy. We sometimes deliver them into solitude and neglect. We prefer your mercy to real justice, Straighten our path so that we can be guided in your way. Now, O oh Lord, transform us as we continue our confession in silence.
God's unconditional love does not seek appearances or conditions, but loves in such a way that we are restored to health and we are restored to wholeness. Thanks be to God for this amazing gift. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. Let us now prepare our hearts for the reading of God's word with the prayer of illumination. Let us pray. Holy God, this is the time when we quiet our hearts and our minds to pay attention, to really pay attention to what you have to say to us today. Fill us with your word and give us understanding by your Holy Spirit that having heard your word, we may live lives worthy of you and please you in every way. In Jesus' name, amen. Today's Old Testament reading is Isaiah 45, verses 22 through 25, which can be found on Old Testament, page 676 in the Pew Bibles. Please hear the word of the Lord. Turn to me and be saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. By myself I have sworn, from my mouth has gone forth in righteousness a word that shall not return. To me every knee shall bow, every tongue shall swear. Only in the Lord it shall be said of me, our righteousness and strength. All who were incensed against him shall come to him and be ashamed. In the Lord, all the offspring of Israel shall triumph and glory. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good morning. Uh, now we're at a point in the service where we invite all of our young disciples to head up to the front if you'd like to join us up here. Um, otherwise, you're welcome to stay in the pews with your folks. All right, we got a few. As you guys are coming up, I actually have a couple of cards to pass out, and I actually may need to invite Fred. Can I give you one of these? I'm going to actually have to maybe give out a few. Somebody's going to get a couple extra. All right, let's see. Will you take that one for me? Thank you. All right, there we go. And let's see. Give Fred an extra. Ooh, maybe. I think we'll, I think we'll make it work. Will you hold that one for me? All right. So 
everybody has a word or possibly multiple words if they're doing double duty today. Um, and each of these words has meaning by itself. Can you tell me, can we look at your word really quick? If you want to turn it around, her word says Jesus. So that's an important word, even by itself, a very important word. What about, what about this word? You want to turn it around? So that word says Christ, also an important word. Now, everybody has a word, so what word, what word do you have? Have, also a word, also has meaning. But if we put all these words together in a certain order, so if we work together with what we individually have, I think we can put something together that's more than any of the one words by themselves. So will you guys take your words for me, and we're just going to set them right here. You can set them down, and we'll set them so they're facing the congregation, even though we know they probably can't see them. You can just take them and set them down, and we're going to try and figure out what order they might need to go in. Oh, yes, it looks like we're doing a really good job so far. So Jesus, and what could go after Jesus? Yes, very good. Now, let's see. That word there at the end, could you bring that? Could you guys bring that over here? Let's see if it works over here. Perfect. Okay. Now, you guys can't see it, so I will, I will read it out loud on the microphone for you. But it says, have the same mindset as Jesus Christ. Now, that is from Philippians 2, which we're going to talk about more today and more in depth. Um, and they have just put this in order for us, and it all makes more sense when it works together. And that's the beginning of Philippians 2, is when we work together as followers of Christ, and we have the same mindset as Jesus, then we do much more than any one of us could do alone. Will you pray with me? Dear God, please help me think and act like Jesus Christ. Amen.
Our New Testament reading and preaching text comes from Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. For those of you that are with us live, um, that can be found on New Testament page 197 in the Pew Bible. If you are prone to memorizing scripture, or even if you haven't ever tried this, I would really recommend, um, especially the second half of this, uh, starting at about verse 5. This is one of the deepest uh, views in the New Testament about who Jesus is. If you committed this to memory, it would be a powerful uh, thing that would continue to pay off dividends as you uh, continue to grow in understanding who Jesus is. Philippians 2, 1 through 11. If then there is any encouragement in Christ, any consolation from love, any sharing in the Spirit, any compassion and sympathy, make my joy complete. Be of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, and being found in human form. He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. This is the word of the Lord. So as we begin today, I want to ask you to think about heroes. Who are the heroes in your life Who do you think of as heroes? Do you have heroes? They can be real people. They can be fictional characters from literature, movies, TV. Um, They can have superhuman abilities. They can be just normal, everyday Joes. Who are your heroes? Now, uh, my guess is some of you are already skeptical. You're already, you know, we're in a church setting, we're here, some of you are going, you're going to pitch Jesus as a hero, aren't you? You're going you're gonna to do that. You know, yes I am, okay, I'll, let's just be honest. But I do want you to think about this more than just every time we answer something in church that Jesus be the, you know, Jesus is the answer that uh, we throw out if we're not listening. Because we know that like 90% of the time in the church, Jesus is the right answer. But I want us to think about it deep deeper than that. Because whenever we think about what our heroes are like, we ask the question of what, why are these people our heroes and why are other people not our heroes? If Jesus is one of your heroes, ask yourself, why have I made him one of my heroes? If he's not, ask yourself, why have I excluded him from the list? After responding to the call of Jesus, the early church wrestled with a bunch of questions. And chief among them was, just who exactly is Jesus? From the Old Testament, we understand that there was a commitment to the idea of one God. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4, it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is your God, the Lord alone. Now, That's not the only place in the New Testament that it talks about the idea of one God. Many times in the Old Testament, it compares the one God of Israel with the multiple gods that surround them, the multiple gods um, worshipped by the nations around them. And the question that the early church was wrestling with right after Jesus left was, does Jesus change our understanding of God? And it kind of went on in early church history. It kind of went on with people landing in different spots and people all over the place and opposing each other and all kinds of nasty examples until about 325 A.D. when the Council of Nicaea met. 
and kind of work this out. And most of the people after that kind of got on the same page of understanding the concept of the Trinity. And here in our text today, the Apostle Paul is doing more than just making a Trinity claim. He is talking about Jesus' identity, but he's also talking about how Jesus functioned because of who he was. Jesus portrayed himself as God, and he talked to and about the Father. He also said there was another, another that was greater than him, that would come after he departed. But our question today, and this is a question we ask in the church all the time, is what does this mean to us? What does this mean to how we do church, to how we do mission, to how we go forward as Christians? Does the identity of Jesus change anything about my life and what's in store for me? You can see what a big deal these questions were to the early church if you look at their writings. Uh, In a few minutes, we're going to share the Apostles' Creed. We're going to say the Apostles' Creed together. And if you look at how it's broken down, there's this teeny little bit that talks about God the Father. There's another teeny little bit at the end that talks about the Spirit. And there's this huge chunk in the middle that talks about who Jesus was. They spent all their time saying, we've got to make sure we get who Jesus was. We've got to make sure that we get that right. Paul makes one of the boldest claims in Scripture in our text today when he says Jesus was in the form of God. And what he means, when we use form, we say something like or something like that. That's not what he's saying. He's saying he is God, okay? Uh, The early church, uh, the way they wrestled with this, they, they said that Jesus and God, if, you know, if you want to be a theology nerd here, I'm kind of empowering you. They said Jesus and God were of the same stuff. They were the same ousia was the word in Greek that they used. And what they meant by that was if they're the same stuff, then they're the same. So if the Father is God and Jesus is the same stuff, then he is God too. We... I want you to understand maybe this in this way. We are a church that, sh- that sits in the, in the shadow of one of the premier research universities in the world. And because of that, we have all these amazing gifted people around us, with some with really impressive um, degrees, some with multiple impressive degrees. And if we looked at their diplomas, we would see that they follow kind of a pattern. They say what the degree is in. They announce that clearly. But after that, they say something like this. With all the honors, rights, privileges, and obligations pertaining to that degree. We tend to think more about the honors, rights, and privileges that come with a degree. But let's not forget the obligations. When we give people these diplomas, when we trust people in this way, there we expect things of them too. There are obligations. Jesus is God. He has every right to receive the honors, rights, and privileges that come with that identity. But instead of just sitting on the throne and receiving uh, what his identity is owed, Jesus spends his time fulfilling the obligations. Instead of using the position for his own glory, Jesus took the lowliest of positions, one that was equated with being a slave. Jesus set his rights and privileges aside to serve. Just think of how rare that is in our world. How often do we see, how often do we ourselves put off some of our rights and privileges to serve. In his autobiography, General Norman Schwarzkopf told about the experience of becoming a general. Um, I don't know a ton about how the military works and different things. It may have changed by this, but when Schwarzkopf became a general, they actually had to go to general school. And so he went to general school, he was in the army, he went with people from the Navy, the Marines, um, the Air Force and all this. They were all gathered together, all those that had become generals at the same time. And when he was heading to general school, he was kind of wondering what it was going to be like. 
And he said what he thought was going to happen. He said, you know, I think right off the bat, they're going to set the mark. They're going to really establish who we are. They're going to say something like, you are a general. You have attained this position. You are the point zero 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 whatever of military hierarchy. You are really, really a big deal. At Schwarzkopf School, the Deputy Secretary of Defense gave the opening to speech. And early in his speech, he started yelling at them. He said, you are a general. You are not better looking to women. You are not above the law. You have to do what your superiors say. You have to do what the president says. And he just went on and on. And Schwarzkopf sat there and he said, what in the world did the people before me do? Well, we get what they did. They understood what they could do, but they didn't hold on to their obligations. They let it get to their head a little bit too much. And one of the things we see about Jesus is Jesus is so often different than how we are. He's participated, think of what he has been involved in. He has participated in the creation of the cosmos. He has the power to do things that we can't even fathom. But instead of using these realities for his own benefit, he used them for the betterment of all creation by humbling himself submitting to a life and to a death that was well below what he deserved. And it was by his willingness to do this, to de-escalate himself, that he attained what was always destined to be for him to attain. The title that demands that all bow before him. The title that requires every mouth to confess that Jesus is the king. It was by his profound humility that Jesus brought the ultimate glory to God. It's like completely counterintuitive, isn't it? That Jesus attained this high position by going to the lowest position. By that, Jesus brought supreme glory to the Godhead. But I think this is why we have trouble recognizing Jesus as a hero. Because what he did... That's not our picture of what a hero is. In our world, heroes break through. Heroes beat up the bad guys and overcome the obstacles. Heroes look the part of heroes. Jesus definitely broke through and overcame, but not exactly the way we think that heroes are supposed to do it. And Jesus didn't look anything like Thor in the Marvel comics. But by winning in the way he did, he gave the opportunity for all of us to overcome as well. It allows us to live by what was written in the first part of our text today. Now, whenever you're going through the Bible, I want you to kind of have in mind, whenever you hit something that repeats, uh, just understand this is super important. Um, It was a Hebrew practice that you used repetition kind of to get people's attention. Like, okay, I'm going to say this multiple times, and I really want you to grasp this. And early on in our text, um, the writer Paul does that real well. He throws out this repetition uh, so that we'd see something four times in the first sentence. It says, if there is any encouragement in Christ any consolation from love, any sharing in the Spirit, any compassion and sympathy. Realize any is the great equalizer in the text. Instead of calling out to those with the deepest conviction in the church, it calls to everybody, even those that have the most minor conviction, even those who maybe fail more often than others. If you have any commitment to God at all, You're included in Paul's plea. And what is his call to even the least of these? To be of the same mind. To have the same love. To not be selfish or conceited. To think the way Christ thought about things. When I read that list, I go kind of, are you serious? That's a real, that's not an easy list. I don't accomplish that even on my best days. The church we experience in the world today 
doesn't come close to living these things out. Every church has problems. Every church has conflict. Every one of us in the church has our own personal difficulties. But Paul appeals to all of us. That's odd, isn't it? Wouldn't you think he'd made his appeal to the most committed instead of the least? I would have thought that. We can't do what's being asked. We don't come close to realizing this. So the question is, is there still hope? There is. But the hope is in an unlikely hero. The one we've already encountered in the text. Jesus is the hope. Jesus is the hero. But it's only after we understand that we can't live up to the standard that we grasp who he is. After laying out this list that we can't live consistently with, Paul reminds us of the one that did and does live in this way. He explains who Jesus is and what it means to us. You see, the only way to really get Jesus, the only way to really understand who he is, to understand who we is to understand who we aren't and what we can't do. Only then are we able to taste of who Jesus is and understand what it means. Because of who we aren't and who Jesus is, we need to redefine what we see as a hero and what we don't see as a hero. The pictures that are created on the field of battle, in the sports arena, or in media, they're usually only one-dimensional pictures. They don't show the full story. And their activities and accomplishments are mostly only the narrow side of who they really are. But Jesus, by doing almost exactly what we don't want our heroes to do, gives us an example that we can't follow, but one we should try to imitate. A hero that lowers himself, and by lowering himself, he honors God. And by doing that, he elevates all of creation. The question that this has for us is, why isn't this our picture of a hero? Is it because we really don't believe that this is what a hero is? Or is it because this example of a hero is even less attainable than those other pictures we have? This text calls out to us. It asks us this question. Does our view of a hero need a little work? Does it need to look more like Jesus? Let us pray. Give your church, O God, the ability to understand who you truly are, that you are the one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that what you do flows out of who you are. You humbled yourself to serve and set an example for all of humanity to do likewise. Open our eyes to the suffering of the world and give us the grace to serve our world and you with courage. We pray for the suffering, those among us that are going through things and those that are beyond our message. Bring your healing to their situations. We have noticed the new variants and the increase in COVID cases. We pray for the medical researchers and personnel who are responding. Give them intelligence and ingenuity in their attacks against this pandemic. Protect people from this virus and bring this pandemic to an end. We pray for the Ukrainian people. Protect them. End their war. May our lives be witnesses to your compassion and our actions a testimony to your mercy. Through Jesus Christ, our hero and our Lord, by the power of the Holy Spirit we pray. Amen. Let us now affirm our faith together with the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again from the dead. 
He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Right belief isn't the only thing that we need. The world is full of people with right belief of who God is, of who Jesus is, that don't let it take action in their souls, in their hearts. God honors their wishes. Understanding who Jesus is is step one, but then putting it in gear and continuing to grow in understanding and continuing to grow in activity. That's what Jesus calls us to. That's what the relational God, who is the hero, calls us to do. And as we do that, it makes it easier to put our tithes and offerings into these plates because we are reminded these things that we have, these gifts, these abilities, these financial situations, they're not what carry us. Our hope is always in the God who can go beyond who we are and what we do, the God that always makes a way when there is not a way. If you have not yet, please pass uh, the fellowship pads down your pew. Give everybody a chance to sign in. Now let us unite our voices with the prayer the Lord taught the disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
You might be processing what it looks like to understand Jesus in a new and deeper way. If you uh, need someone to process that with, we have an elder on duty. Sarah Hinton is with us up here. She would love to talk to you about that and love to help walk with you as you uh, wrestle to understand Jesus in new and more powerful ways. Also, if you're a person who's been with us a while or uh, is even here for the first time but says, you know what, this is my church. Uh, I want to bring my membership here. I want to connect with this church. Sarah will also talk to you about how to go forward with that. Um, Also, we have the parking lot roundtable discussion over here. Meet Jeff Spiegel over here, and he'd love to talk to you about what's going on with that, what our options and opportunities are. I wonder if the hard reason to see Jesus as a hero is lots of times the heroes we see, we say, ah, I'd like to be like that. I'd like to do those things. Lots of times Jesus' example, we respond the opposite. We're like, phew, glad I wasn't called to do that. But we are. We are called to follow Jesus, but he shows us that because of him, the path is possible. He will make up the difference for us. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine round about you and bring you hope and bring you peace. Amen. Become part of a community that seeks to glorify God, to make disciples of Jesus Christ, and meet human needs. Join us at First Presbyterian Sundays at 8.30 and 10.55, or watch us on My 11 every Sunday morning at 9. We welcome you.